Tony, I just had two questions about this weekend. First, just with the weather, is there any possibility of a doubleheader um, and maybe eliminating one day? I wouldn't think so. I mean, you, you talk to almost every college baseball coach, and none of them are really fans of doubleheaders uh, for a few different reasons. But I think we're good Friday, Sunday. Friday, of course, is where our, you know, cliched focus is. But, um, you know, Saturday could create some difficulties. The last one I looked at I think will be okay. But uh, this turf is incredibly resilient. And when we have a whole, you know, day to work with from morning until night, I'd like to think we could – you know, get the thing in. And at the very least, one thing you may see at some point this weekend or just this year is starting a game and then completing it, um, you know, later the next day. And then just when kind of looking at LSU this week and preparing for them, just what have you seen from from them and what's at the top of your uh, priority list in terms of making sure you all are good in that area to come out with a win this weekend? Yeah, priority number one is go through our normal routine. It's a, it's a great, you know, part of the year. Um, you know, where you're kind of in the flow of things. Um, it's all downhill hill from here as far as academics. Um, we're not going to do a lot of crazy stuff at practice. Again, just, just kind of follow our routines. Our, our kids could almost tell you exactly how each day is going to go. The only thing that changes is the opponents. And we talk about this weekend's opponent. It's obviously a school with a phenomenal tradition. And our, our, once we get to Friday, my answer for that day, priority number one, is their starting pitcher, Marceau. Um, they'll slide him to Friday. He pitched last uh, Saturday against Mississippi State, but he has a zero ERA. And while he doesn't receive the fanfare that maybe a rocker does <clears throat> or a couple of the other pitchers in our league uh, that throw really hard, he's got every bit as good of numbers. And he, he kind of is a reflection or a mirror image of, of a kid like Garrett Stallings. So uh, that's where my focus is. I know Coach Anderson's got a laser beam focus on preparing for their hitters. Um, they've, they've shown they got a little sock in the bat this year. So uh, that's probably a theme for their offense and, and of course, our approach pitching-wise. It was great to see Pete Durkay get the start behind the plate on Tuesday. Also fantastic to see Connor Pavoloni get a break after the beating he took on Sunday. I was just curious, are there any lingering effects for Connor from all that he experienced on Sunday? And, and is Jackson Greer ready to go again? Yeah, there, there's, um, you know, a, a, a situation there with, with Pav where it, it's probably going to be sore for a while, but I think the best thing was to get him treatment like he got and he ran yesterday. I think it should be fine, but he's not going to be at 100%. And uh, I, everyone knows I think Pav's a warrior, but I say this a little bit tongue-in-cheek. There ain't anybody on this call or that's going to wear a uniform this weekend that's 100%. So, it's grind time, and, and nobody does that better than Pav. And, you know, Pete had a blast catching because Jackson Greer, you know, had to see the doctor this week, and he'll be back eventually as well. But Pete's fully capable, and uh, the cool thing was he had a blast with that. So, um, you know, Jackson Leith will be out for the rest of the year um, since you asked the question. Um, it's, it's one of the things, you know, you, you look at how highly everyone wants to, to rank any SEC team, but especially all – and you know talk about things we can do and internally we've kind of you know known this for a while or at least thought it would occur you know we're we're down uh, an arm and uh, we've got a couple guys that are on the shelf and now a couple guys that I think could eventually pitch in the big leagues that are out for the year um, so all's it all all's it is is adversity which our guys have grown to like a little bit it seems like at least it's the way they talk and then the other thing is it opens up the door for a guy like Camden Sewell to finish the game or Fitzy to start a game. Um, and several other guys like McLaughlin and Housley have stepped up as well. So uh, not great news for Jackson. Um, we can talk about that more down the road once he finally, you know, has his operation and, and knows what his deal is. But uh, he, he will not be active this weekend, obviously. All right, we'll go to Tim next, and then we'll go to Troy after that. Oh, Tim can't hear you. Looks like you're unmuted. All right, we'll go to we'll Troy next, and then we'll try to Tim again in a minute. Tony, you mentioned Marceau, but they obviously also have Jaden Hill, who's a you know a top ten guy in most mock drafts. I guess how big of a test is this for your lineup this week against LSU? Yeah, you know, um, Jaden is someone I'm incredibly familiar with. Um, may have even been the first 
coach to recruit him um, at Arkansas. That's where he's from. He's also got some family that, you know, tied him to LSU somehow. Um, so you get a variety of different pitchers, a kid that Max Ferguson played against and knows very well on Sunday that we offered a scholarship to here at Tennessee. Um, Jaden Hill, a top prospect, who's more of a velo guy on Saturday. And then an incredible pitchability guy, but also, I mean, we're talking getting up to 93, 94 miles an hour from our show. So not only do you have great arms, but you have different looks. And so the key for our guys is to focus on what is in front of them at that very moment. And then also understand that while we want our guys to think their best always beats the opponent's best, uh, you, you can't ignore the fact that there's a different approach that each pitcher calls for. Um, you know, we bring in a submarine guy out of the pen. You're not going to swing the bat the same way against him that you would against, you know, Jack, Jackson Leith or whoever else you want to bring up as an example. All right, we'll go back to Tim, see if we can get this one going. All right, Tony, you mentioned uh, Marceau. Um, going to get the start on Friday night. What do you know about him? What, what does he bring to the table? Well, I think you'll see it immediately. He's, he's got a quiet intensity about him. Um, a little bit like, again, Garrett Stallings used to have for us. Chad Dallas does a little bit, but Chad's got a ton of energy. Um, kind of like Blade Tidwell, you saw that laser beam focus and intensity. So that's where it all starts. I mean, you, you can see he believes in himself. It doesn't take but one pitch or even as just warm-up pitches to see that. Um, it's, a, it's a very slow, methodical delivery he has. So that's one thing that can lull you to sleep a little bit if you don't take that into consideration as a hitter. Um, and then he's going to come at you with a variety of pitches. You, you might have an at-bat or the whole night could go on with your at-bats where you don't see the same pitch two times in a row. Uh, so you're going to have to respect the fact that he not only throws a ton of strikes, but he does it with a variety of, you know, pitches, uh, three, three pitches for, you know, extraordinary command. So next we'll go to Gustavo and then we'll go back and we'll go to Mike. One sec. Coach, uh, first SEC series at home, you know, of course the weather is going to play a big factor, but what do you expect to get out of you guys in such a tough challenge versus LSU, you know, having this SEC series at home for the first time in this season? Yeah, it's kind of scary. I didn't even think about it till this morning. Our last SEC series was, you know, essentially two years ago. It was against Mississippi. And, uh, you know, we won the first two games in front of great crowds, two night games. And then the next day was kind of an ominous uh, point for us. That's where Garrett Crochet broke his jaw and we lost a close game to Mississippi before the SEC tournament. So uh, kind of brings back some memories. It's crazy. It's been that long. But if you do remember it, again, our fans were incredible. Uh, the flavor in the ballpark was, was palpable. It was, it was a tremendous environment that our guys helped create as well. So I'm just looking forward to being in the middle of that deal. And, uh, you know, you're, you're blind if, you, if you're not seeing how strong the tradition is at LSU. So I'm sure they'll, they'll bring in some confidence to the park with what their program's done in the past. And our kids recognize that. So it's, it's up to them whether they want to shy away from that competition or not. That's, that's pretty much what they signed up for in the SEC. Yeah, Tony, you mentioned how LSU is kind of moving some arms around potentially. Do you have any thought of doing the same with yours or are you kind of settled into the order of the three that you currently have? Yeah, settled for now. Um, hell, I was talking with our guys and I, I literally didn't know who we play next weekend and it's not, you know, trying to be smart Alec or, you know, super coach or anything like that. It just, it's such a grind. You have to take what's in front of you. Now we play so many games a week. There may be a Tuesday night where you're looking, you know, what you got to do the next few days or, you know, Friday, you still got to look at what's going on Saturday. Um, for now though, our kids have done a great job. I mean, Will Heflin could have easily stayed in the game longer last week, but we like the fact that Mark McLaughlin, uh, you know, pitched so well the week before wanted to get the ball in his hands. Um, some other guys are showing they can pitch well at the end of a game, like again, Camden Sewell. So while those three starters will be our guys this weekend, and I don't see a reason to change them anytime soon, uh, there are still some moving parts behind those guys. Uh, and then one thing I revert back to the starters is 
they're finally at a point pitch count wise um, and health wise where we, we can let them go. And I didn't really like pulling Blade Tidwell out of that game, but for, for arm concerns, it, it was time to do so. All right, we'll go to John and then back to Ben. Coach, one of the things that stood out as your team won the finale at Georgia was what how you described their reaction, that they certainly celebrated the win, but there was also not the huge celebration because that was their expectation, considering that it took just a little bit for you as you took over the program to, uh, to get these guys to look at the teams that they're competing with in the East and the West as essentially those that they can compete with. What's it been like to watch that team expectation change in this now your fourth year to where it's not like, ooh, SEC play. It's now, let's get it. Yeah, no, it it's satisfying, but you also got that bridge in there <laughs> or however you want to term it where baseball vanished for a while. So it's a little frustrating that you didn't get to see that, that evolving the, the, in the pattern you, you kind of envision. So, but regardless, here we are. And I think our guys do have some self-belief to them. And, you know, coach Elander is a huge part of what we do recruiting wise and offensively uh, and does a great job with our catchers. I coached him at TCU and I was a madman back then. I was putting like two different quotes in their locker every day and all kinds of stuff. And he kept all that. And his favorite thing was, we used to say, if you believe it, it's true. And in a sport like golf or baseball, especially, but also every sport, if you believe something, that's probably what the outcome is going to be, or at least close to it. And I think this group in particular believes they've got the ability to compete with anyone while at the same time recognizing, hey, we've had some injuries. Our roster is not even as good as it was to start the season, but also at the start of the season, it's fair to say we did not have the best roster in the country. Um, but regardless, that self-belief seems to be unwavering for now. The challenge in our league is you got to play 30 games. So it's great that they had that mindset over the course of one weekend, but you got to do it 10 times and you got to do it against opponents that are going to be on Georgia's level. Some maybe even higher, some equal to maybe some a little bit less, but everybody on this call and, and anyone listening knows what a grind is. The SEC is particularly with 30 games. Tony, just what makes Blade so effective? I, I know you've talked about, you know, his mentality coming in as a freshman and now he's gotten into a routine of, un, under Frank. Uh, we, we see the pop on the radar gun when he's throwing his fastball, but just from a, a stuff standpoint, what makes him so effective? Yeah, well, the, the other kid, the Cannon kid that pitched against him was touching 95 as well. And he also had a breaking ball he could throw for a strike. Um, also was a big guy and physical. So, there's a lot of guys like that in the country and a ton of them are in our league, but I think what separates him is his incredible intensity. Again, maybe he doesn't wear it on a sleeve like a crochet or a Dallas, but um, incredible intent behind everything he's doing. And, and that, that kind of spills over into my next answer. In incredibly professional for a freshman. Um, again, our league, is notorious for producing big leaguers. And you see some of those guys like an A.J. Puck, who's a huge, tall lefty. Um, we faced him once where no one could literally even make contact. I mean, I hate to admit it. We were laughing in the dugout at Arkansas a few years back, how good he was. But his first start as a freshman, he didn't even get out of the first inning. So a lot of these kids, it takes them a while to evolve. But as far as the professionalism and the maturity behind his routines and his work ethic, I think he's – far ahead of where some of those guys were. And to me, that's a difference maker. All right, guys, we got time for two more. We'll go to Mike next. Yeah, Tony, on, on the Jackson Leith note, I mean, how, how heartbreaking is that for him as a guy who, you know, came back with such a focus on, on getting a chance to compete in the SEC and, and do all the things that kind of remain the rest of this year? Yeah, you know, it, it's, a, it's a story to me that's a big enough deal. It, it kind of deserves its own section. So that I didn't mean to breeze over it. Um, and, and I had planned to let the weekend pass and then kind of make it formal. And, and he would have been more readily available to answer questions. Um, but, but since you ask, I mean, to, to at least start the conversation with you guys, whether it's for the public or just between you and I or Jackson, it, it's crushing. Um, the guy is a maniac worker. 
Uh, it's well documented. He, he sacrificed financially to come here, uh, um, turned down the draft twice. And one of the reasons he did it was he, he wanted to pitch in this league and he's you know, not going to get to do it. So we'll see what happens from here. But uh, the one remarkable thing is his attitude, his mentality and attitude are kind of built like he, his physique. I mean, the guy's as jacked as anybody on our team. They tease him about it. Um, and he's able to rebound and just say, this, this is the way it's supposed to go for me and I'll overcome and the right thing will work out. And that, that's not easy to do in that situation, but that's kind of been his, his mindset. Ben, did you have one more? No, sorry. Okay, we'll finish. Sean, did you have one? Yeah, I got one. Uh, uh, hey, you. you talked about fans earlier and um, with the COVID vaccine going around, um, have you heard anything from the university or the conference about possibly raising up the capacity for fans to come and watch baseball games? Yeah, Reed, Reed Sigmund, uh, who's a huge part of our administration here um, and very well known in college athletics, he came over to our practice yesterday. I thought he was looking for some free batting practice, but he, he wasn't a tie. Uh, he brought me a commemorative ball, which I definitely appreciate. But I can tell you what I appreciate a thousand times more than that ball is the word that they're working hard to increase capacity at our stadium. And I'm not in charge of that, so I don't want to misspeak. But I know there will be more tickets available for this weekend. Um, and, and that capacity has been growing and will continue to grow, probably in incremental and intelligently, um, you, you know, kind of devising steps that will go along the way where we're not just going to open up the whole stadium. But the bottom line is there will be more fans. The fans that have been here have been awesome. I think they feel like, hey, there's not as many people, so I got to cheer twice as loud. So they've been great but we'll take the more numbers and the greater volume for sure. And, and that's going to occur this weekend. And then we'll, we'll see what they decide to, to do as far as increasing it as time goes on. Thanks coach. Appreciate it. And yeah. Thank you guys. Take care and stay dry.